Hello, everybody. My name is Ming Luke, Program Director for Festival Napa Valley's Blackburn Music Academy. I'd like to welcome you to these special master classes provided by the Met Orchestra Musicians. job um you know this this excerpt or this passage for me is always like something i always have to go back to it's such a tricky one but your technique sounds fantastic um the first thing that i hear um that jumps out at me is musical phrasing i think that when we practice these excerpts so much they become just like they're these exercises and we tend to forget that they are music and they are you know in in the context of this great big opera so it's tricky with this piece because every it's marked piano and we have to stay or pianissimo and we're trying to stay as soft as possible but that doesn't mean things should stay placid there's a lot happening with the harmony. Um, so right off the bat, I think what we need to do is really lead to the third measure, right? So we're, we're the first measure, we're, we're ornamenting the tonic, and then we go up to the dominant in the third measure. And I think that we really need to show that. It's, it's easy to be safe and keep it all penis mode. But I think it's more important for the listener to recognize, oh, there's there's a musical direction here. So don't be afraid to, to give a little crescendo. And then in in that bar, the the trill around A, that A G sharp A, then you can come back to um, piano or the the dynamic that you started at, started at. Um let's see, do you want to give that a try? Sure. Yeah, that's great. I al already hear the the musical direction. Um, let's see. The um, the other thing that I was going to say is really finding the clarity in each of the first notes of the slurs. It's really easy to play this at compress the, the, the easy, easy sub, you know, easy fingerings and then like, like slowing down. So we want the, the time and the, the spacing in this passage to be really even. So those first no notes of articulation, the slurs, they land on the beat, they emphasize the harmony and they can kind of help us keep the, the time true. I also wanted to mention was these repeated notes. I think it's really important, especially in an audition setting, to really protect the sound when with these repeated notes. But I think as bassoonists, we have it's easy for us to push the the the, the loud volume, really go for it to achieve the loud dynamic. But it's it tends to go so far and get reedy and buzzy. And I think that's something I try to avoid all the time. I'm always like turning to Anton, like, did that sound buzzy? Like, <laughs> I'm just trying to always be mindful of it. So especially in an audition, if that means coming off of the dynamic, yes, because I would rather hear, oh, that was like really pretty, that was tasteful, than like, I can play forte, but, it doesn't sound as controlled and pretty. Your pre-recorded thing, video that you sent, I had a comment uh, when 
the fingerings get easier, like when you get to the, the flourish around the G, F sharp, but da 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 right? Yeah. I, I heard in the video that that was really compressed and rushed. And then the rest of the, the, the tail end of the excerpt, the, the tempo significantly bumped up to make up, to adjust, you like adjusted for that time. Something I really like to do um, to help practice this excerpt is to put my metronome on the off beats. Have you ever tried that? Yeah. Yeah. Do you like, I try and do like the off beats for this one, quarter note off beats or like half note off beats, like beats, just like beat three, um, just to like really test my, um, my time because it's so easy to just like go crazy with this one. Um, but that's all that I can think of. Um, that, that's all I had to say about this excerpt. Anton, did you have anything to say? I have a, a couple couple things I could say. First, Mackenzie, it's so good to see you again. I know, it's been, it's what, been, like nine years or something? I think, I think nine years almost yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. So I hope you're doing well. You sound beautiful. It's so nice to hear you play. It's so like, you know, all the things that Evan was saying, it's so elegant, it sounds, it sounds effortless. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna sort of echo what he said a bit about keeping track of the shape, even the technical stuff. Um, also, like in the forte, in the, in the articulation, I think there it might set you apart from, you know, people who just come in and view it as a purely technical, tonguing um, achievement. You might want to show the shape a little bit. Like maybe have like sort of some little hairpins throughout or something. Very subtle, more like you're thinking it. And then, you know, it's coming across just a tiny bit to the, to the listener, to the very friendly audition committee. My main comment, which also is uh, very very similar to what, what Evan was saying, is about the, um, the articulation in the opening. And what I tend to hear when you just played it um, is slight accents, like slight sharp accents. And I often find in stuff like this um, that if you play it totally in time, like every note metronomically the same, you're gonna, the listener is going to hear some notes as being faster. Like they're just not going to hear the first note as much. So to them, it might sound like you're rushing off of that or like it's a little too sharply accented. So I would suggest maybe you try this and think, instead of like a sharp accent, a little tiny bit more tenuto. And then that way, I think it might be easier for you to sort of get that, the kind of like circular line. Okay, okay so it never seems too disrupted, but it's still very clear. Um, and I think also like starting that way, it might be easier for you because it's, you know, it's more relaxing of an attack. It's not like a, you know, edge of your seat kind of pinpoint, but it's more like an exhale. Um, so I, that's what I was thinking. Other, other than that, like I had, I had nothing. I thought the technique was, was super even, super clean. Um, do you have any questions about this passage? Any like concerns or things you're wondering about? Oh, no, it was, it was pretty straightforward. Cool. Um, what was the next thing Chaik, Tchaikovsky yeah, said? Six, the opening. Cool, let's do it. Was really great that was really great um excellent low ease uh attack sounded really effortless 
Um, the dynamics were very clear. Um, everything sounded very well placed to me. Um, if I think that this excerpt is a really uh, good uh, context to, to like explore legato. This is like the first thing I do every single day when I break in my practicing is um, I just like start by connecting two notes, like focusing on keeping my air um, really consistent and like increasing my vibrato uh, ever so much and then just moving my finger so that I don't necessarily readjust my air or there's a bump. Yeah, I think that also helps vibrato. I noticed a couple of times, like right before you reached the the high point of all these little mini phrases, your vibrato would stop okay. just slightly before you the note, the pitch switched. So that's just something to be aware of. I know that's so little, but like, I like that's something that I obsess over all the time. And so my that's just something that I heard. Um, but I thought everything was, yeah, really, really, really beautiful. Really. Thank great, you. To hear, great to hear it. Um, Anton, do you have anything you'd like to add? Sure. I'll say a couple of things. Um, uh, yeah, again, like, like, John, like, like Evan said, it's, it's beautiful. Like, it's so resonant. It's so, like, it doesn't sound like you're, you're, like, like you're afraid of the attacks. It just sounds really effortlessly full, which I love hearing. Um, I sort of echo what, what, what Evan was saying about the um, the vibrato, in that I think it could you could find ways to have it help the line, um, and especially maybe you could have a little more contrast in the vibrato and like in the, the the weight that you give on certain notes, like sort of letting the the vocal quality of it dictate, so you don't get too obsessive and too you know micromanaging about it. Like you want it to sound really natural and sung. I, do you like practice vibrato? Is that a thing? Like I feel like when I was in school. It was just like, oh yeah, you do vibrato or you don't do vibrato. It was like never like, this is how we should approach vibrato. Um, I, I try to think about the speed in relation to the context of what I'm playing and mm -hmm. like what's appropriate with other instruments that I might be playing with, but I've never yeah. like sat down and like done a vibrato exercise. Before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, like in this context, if we're going to continue to talk about vibrato, like we're playing with the double basses here. So like a fast skinny vibrato on the double bass would just sound really goofy. Yeah. So they're doing the, you know, see them like yeah. wide wobbling down there. Um, so um, that's definitely something to practice. Um, when I'm practicing vibrato, I'll do it like start metronome, quarter note equals 50, play the scale, play a scale and just like, or a single note and just like do like two inflections then three inflections, four inflections and like build it up so that like, you're really pushing the boundaries of uh, your vibrato. Cause it's, it's just a tool that luckily we get to use to maximize our expression. And like to like echo what Anton was saying, like especially when we get to these um low like the half notes particularly the f sharp the g and then the a sharp i think that we can really achieve that lull in the phrase by like really slowing down the vibrato and using the vibrato to show the crescendo as opposed to the dynamic Okay. So that it's like an increase of intensity as opposed to volume. Like Anton said, this is like such nitpicky things, but unfortunately it's like, that's kind of what we're doing all the time. <laughs> 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 just like splitting hairs with this stuff. Um, just one more thing, like maybe coming from a clarinet player who doesn't use vibrato mm. consistently, maybe try this without vibrato and see if you can get you know, the shape and the weight and the color changes and like everything that you would want musically and then see like how the vibrato then could fit to that. Sounds great, Mackenzie, really.
Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Oh, well, thanks so much, guys. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for playing. Yeah, thanks for playing. Hi there. Hi, Liam. Hi, Liam. Um, I'm Liam Jackson. I'm currently living in Chicago, Illinois, and I'm from Detroit, Michigan, originally. And today I have the Rite of Spring opening and the second bassoon opening to the overture to Tannhäuser. Uh, does it matter to you which I play first? No, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Good job. Beautiful, really expressive, um, beautiful sound. Um, I would like, I would really encourage you to practice this with a metronome. Um, I think it's really tempting to really, you know, schmaltz this solo up and um, really expand things and um, be robot, uh, robotic. Um, but we have to remember that, um, for the listener, this is a really confusing passage. When I, when I'm practicing this, I'm putting it down the octave. Quarter note equals 50. Just to like, okay, I'm not thinking about these terrible fingerings, you know, how, are, is this now going to come out? Is how, you know, whatever. Um, because th it's just... We know Stravinsky is a rhythmic composer, right? So I think that we really need to, I, you know, I don't want to say like be like strict about, I mean, we have to be like honest with the time. We have to be true with it, but we don't want to sound robotic. Um, uh, robotic, not robotic, excuse me. <laughs> um, so it's like this like tricky balance that we have to achieve. I think, you know, the fermata on the sea and then the the next beat, the four sixteenth notes with the grace note. That's uh, that's us. That's we can do whatever the heck we want to with that. The conductor is usually just like, have at it, you know. Um, the second half of that first bar, onwards, however, is a completely different story because we have to bring in the, the is it the second horn in, and they have to know what is going on here, right? During that A fermata, I'm really thinking triplets as best as I can. I felt that it, your rhythm was a little ambiguous. Um, and then when you got into the eighth notes, it the tempo really slowed down. So, which is, which is totally easy to do. Like it's, that's why putting down the octave where you're not concerned about fingerings, it's really telling. But another thing I like to focus on on those triplets is really landing on the G and having the right amount of vibrato spin on that G is really important because it falls on the beat. And if you're subdividing the it really helps us okay this is my pulse because now this is when things start to get much more um you know strict with the tempo people are coming in and then that helps with the eighth notes because then we can think okay now i have established the pulse and then this next bar, one and two and three and four. Okay, Anton, do you have anything to add? 
I'll, I'll try. I mean, Liam, it sounds it sounds so beautiful, and I, I loved your first note. I just loved that it was you know full from the beginning without being accented, without there being a delay. It just sounded it sounded really beautiful. Um, I again, I'm, I'm just kind of kind of going to echo what's been said about rhythm, and I, I think like a huge, hugely important thing in making this exact and making this really organized in your head is um, Evan touched on this on this when, when he was giving comments, but like making sure that the rhythmic emphasis is there and it's in the right places. It's metrically kind of, or rhythmically, rhythmically kind of ambiguous. There's a lot of grace notes. And just thinking about like, how do I want the grace notes to fit? Do I want things like this to be lyrical? Do I want them to be um, accented? You know, when I'm practicing Stravinsky, I have a tendency to want to play the grace notes early. So like in the, um, in the the second bar, the bottom, bottom, bottom. So often, I want to be like bottom, 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 and short change the last note. So if you can make sure that like bottom, bottom, like it's it fits very squarely. And to me, a lot of times that means the grace notes have to be a little later and a little closer to the beat. I tend to not like when grace notes affect the rhythm too much. So if you can keep that in mind and you know, maybe have a, have a metronome going a couple of times just to make sure that it's really lining up. Stuff like that. That's a good point. Like, grace notes, like, it's not about the grace note them itself unless it's, like, accented in the, the, the score. It's more the a note it's attached to is the note that's important. So keeping it evenly scaled so that the note, the main note, the big note, is the one that's getting the emphasis. Totally. Yeah, so, but good, really good, loved yeah. it, beautiful. Great, right, thank you. This one's tough. It's really tough. I thought your tenuto legato was really great. Um, I thought the articulation was really great. Um, careful to not let your breaths affect the time, especially in like an audition setting. There's going to be some one person on the panel tapping their finger on the desk, making sure that you are in time. And so, and like in the, in the context, yeah, like it's not the second bassoon show, it's the clarinet and horn show. When I listened to your, to your um, uh, recording of it, we got a couple, you know, a while back, um, I think it's really easy for us to get too loud too quickly. I would save the, the, the the crescendo for as late on the B as possible and most of it coming from the the sixteenth note. Um so that it's not too loud. Um and um also um the other the last hairpin um where the F sharp is on the second beat, I would real I would try and even though there's that crescendo written, I wouldn't I would kind of want to like shade that F sharp since the harm the harmony were really going an X on B, and since it's higher in pitch, it's going to sound a little louder. Um, so save that crescendo for the D sharp, Anton. I liked your tenuto tonguing. I think maybe it could be like a little less like tongue, like maybe even just more tenuto. So there's more air in the phrase. There's more air in the sort of more breadth in the tone and less less sharp tonguing. Um, I mean, the tonguing was not sharp, 
but I think it could it could be even even softer. Um, especially like in the triplet. Be like every clarinet player. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> they can really throw us under the bus with that. But I don't know. Like in the triplet, I just I wasn't hearing the piece so much. Mm. Um, so maybe a little more just warmth in the line, follow the line a bit more so that there's no rough edges, nothing like, I don't think it has to be, you know, too direct, you know, with the phrasing, but just sort of imbuing it with a little bit more warmth, sort of playing into the line more, I, I think would maybe make it feel a little bit more comfortable. Thank you both so much. Yeah, you, you sound beautiful. Thank you. Any questions about any of the, either of the excerpts? The only thing uh, I think about the the overture being non vibrato, based on the instruments that I'm playing with, and just um, finding more ways to create that warmth that you're talking about in the line without vibrato, which is kind of a clarinet player is one of the you know people you can ask a question like that too. Um, but do you have any any ideas about just creating that phrasing without warming up the tone in the way that, as a bassoonist, I would be uh, reflexively more used to? For me, that question's for me. For either of you. Yeah. I mean, I would add vibrato in an audition. Um, Interesting. But not, I'm not going to ham it up, but I think that there needs to be a subtle thing. Because, like, I mean, an audition is just such a weird situation in general. So... I think, yeah, this balance of do we vibrate because we know we're playing with non-vibrating instruments, but we're playing it by ourselves. For me, I would add a slow, subtle vibrato. That would be my personal choice. I mean, unless it's like a, a super fast, like really blatant vibrato, I don't think it's going it, to, it's not going to count against you. Um, I mean, even in context, like, I like to listen to what's going on around me. And if I'm hearing, oh, wow, the second bassoon is so beautiful and there's a little vibrato, like, oh, I want some of that. Like, maybe I'll... Thank you. That helps a lot. Great. Sounds excellent. Thank you. Thanks. And next we have Michelle Keem. So, Michelle Keem, if you want to introduce yourself and what you're playing. Good to see you again. Um, I thought it was really pretty. The sound is great. Um, I would encourage you to go even like softer at certain points. I think that we, I think all wind players have, it's much easier for us to play crescendos, play louder, play, you know, go. And like, it's much more difficult to find or to like achieve that, like the low points. I couldn't hear the accents actually oh, okay. um, in the, the second iteration of the, of the solo. Um, so if that means uh, exploring, playing the, 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 you know, the, the 16th notes a little softer if that means doing something with the time, um, we need to hear that the the emphasis emphasis of the the melody has changed to those uh, to those accents. It sounds like you have a plan for what you're doing, and so I would just encourage you to do it more, more obvious. Um, Anton, do you have anything you want to add? Sure. Um, so yeah, first it was lovely. It was super expressive. Um, like Evan said, I want to hear more shapes and I, and I have a, a couple ideas about that. I want to hear the bigger shapes more clearly. I want to hear like the, you know, the two bar phrases where you really show that you're going someplace and then the two bar phrases where you're receding. Um, that being said, I think it's kind of nice if you maintain the three, eight feel throughout this. So no matter what, you know, expressive expression 
or expressive markings you're doing, the rhythmically less important notes never become um, off balance. I agreed totally about the three eight feel. And then that's what's really tricky, especially with the first three bars, it, having this articulation and this figure written uh, this way. So it can easily sound like it's in two eight. So should we hear some cadenzas? <laughs> technique um okay so i think that you know yes this is a cadenza but we have to be really mindful of how we're coming out of it uh because you know person on the podium has to figure out when to bring the orchestra back in um so i think it's really important to figure out how to set that up First of all, the first two um, idioms of this the, have the accent on the, the downbeat F of when the tempo um, comes back. I did not hear either of those accents. So, and that is really because that is the true arrival of both of those first two um, cadenzas. So that will help, okay? First things first, that's our destination. So now how do we get there? Um, you know, each solo has crescendo written, but I think that we, I think it's printed too soon, in my opinion. I think that we really need to hold on to the piano for longer, um, for each of these solos, because if we get too loud too soon, then it's really difficult to achieve that arrival point, you know? save the crescendo for maybe the last sextuplet, maybe um, the, the three before that to really start going. So another thing we need to do is we need to honor that he wrote Poco Writ. Um, I heard the, the, the written Molto in the, th um, the third solo when you played it, but I didn't hear the, the two before. Okay. So I think that we really need to set that up because that's another detail um, that will help the person on the podium bring in the, bring in the orchestra. I mean, I can demonstrate. <laughs> so we want the... Okay, so that it really is clear to the listener that this is where the time comes back. Um, do you think, I, I'm always worried about doing too much on the Poco Writ. Is that something that I should be concerned with or is it not? I don't think so. I mean like. You know, I just, it's, you're the soloist. I think you, you should go with it. I mean, it is Poco Writ, yes. Um, like you can, do it not so much the first time and then a little bit more the second time. Um, obviously the third time writ molto, we really have to be specific about that. Um, as you know, cause it's, I wouldn't know where to, if I was the conductor where, or, you know, coming in. So it just has to be clear audibly. I think as long as like you can subdivide it, like you can, be like da 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 as opposed to da 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 you know do you hear the difference like as long as you can very clearly map it out so it doesn't get all of a sudden too slow in relation to how you set it up i think right because i've heard some where it sounds 
almost like it just switches to a triplet on that last group. And yeah. I'm trying to avoid doing that, but okay, that makes sense. I think that sounds super lame when it just switches to half tempo or something. Yeah. Um, I like how you set it up, but I think uh, for me that the top note, bum, bum, boo, is maybe a little more important than you're, than you're making it. I like to think of that kind of as like, you know, still forte, and then you can diminuendo. But if you start the diminuendo too soon on the top note, I don't know, it, it sounds a little bit like a letdown. So I like to, you know, hit the top note and then, and then come away from it. Um, also, and this is just purely personal, I like if each of the three entrances have a little bit, you know, a little more of a progression as they go. So maybe the first one is, you know, like you played it. Second one is a little bit angstier, maybe a little bit more tenuto. And then the third one is, is the most. Um, but otherwise, beautiful. That's, that's all. Great. So with this solo, I would also encourage like I said to Mackenzie, like doing tricks with the metronome, I would encourage you to do this as well. To me, I, it sounded almost like the, fir the first half of the solo was all of the same. Um, so I think that we really need to strive to make those, the shapes more clear. I, I don't know how you think about it, but the, this is the way that I think about it. Like the, the first chromatic figure leads to the D and then I'm sustaining the D and then coming back the BC. Because then I think the, the G sharp that follows is like definitely the high point yeah, of, you know, right? So I think that when, when we come back, like I said in Scheherazade, we really need to find where we can come away. Like as wind players, we can, we can just go louder, 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 and then it's much more difficult to to do the diminuendi. So the G sharp being the the high point of the phrase, um, if we, that's why I choose to diminuendo to the C, and then the, and really that G sharp, I mean, vibrato that G sharp up, you know, it happens so fast, like, you know, it can really, it can really use it. Um, so the second half of this solo, so this is another common issue is cracking on the eaves. I think that it's really easy to, I, I hope this is like clear on that, like. Like it's really easy to crack those notes. I don't know if that was clear. The, like you can almost like hear the, the lower octave when you use your tongue to crack these notes, especially when we're leading, you know, we get riled up with the, the music, the phrase of it. Um, so I would, I what for this passage, what I really like to do is um, just do aspirated attacks for those E's, just without the tongue. Because as opposed to, you know, th was that clear the? Yeah, you do that for practicing or also for playing it? You can do it either one, you know? I think just the point is to not have that crunchy sound at the, 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 the front of the note. And why that's happening is we're not using enough air for how much tongue we're using. Right. If that makes sense. There needs to be that balance in this particular register of the bassoon. Do you want to try it? See if that, like, go back and forth between, like, just doing air and then, like, you know, do, like, what you would do normally just to feel, like, the difference? I don't know. Um... Just, just do ease. Just do ease. <laughs> So was that aspirated? No, not good. And that to me, I didn't hear the crack at all. I thought that was pretty, pretty clear. So then like, I think to myself, okay, so this is what my air feels like. Now add the tongue with that air. 
Okay, I think I heard a little, it's, it's hard, it's, you know, especially right now with this um, medium, it's hard to hear all these like fine points, but I would encourage you to practice that, um, especially with Scheherazade. The... Like, I've just been practicing it so much now I can't. You know, as a so you can hear like the tongue, and we don't want to hear the tongue. We want to hear the clarity of the note, but we don't want to hear the tongue. Um, so anytime that there is a articulated passage in this register, I think it's best that we all just every bassoon is just like, okay, what do I have to do with my air so I don't get that crackiness? Yeah. Yeah. So I have like nothing, nothing to add musically. Um, maybe just be aware, like making sure the articulated repeated note doesn't stick out and you know overpower the rest of the line. Um, but it's just so nice, Evan, to hear you talk about the air and the tongue because so often I feel like you know in the pursuit of like short staccato, we emphasize the tongue over the air. Totally. And it, like somehow then there's more pressure there's more tension there's more like smacking the reed with the tongue so i think it's it's so useful and i do this actually all the time to practice without the tongue and just get the exact quality you want and get the shape of the attack and then add the tongue for just like a little bit of security but that's it any other questions for us um no actually that air thing i think clears up some other things in that solo for me that i would have asked about so that was perfect good yeah i want to thank you all again and of course, um, there are several other master classes coming up. I think there's horn and violin coming up later this month. So you can visit the website to see uh, those master classes. But other than that, we'll say goodbye and thank you all again. Thank, thank you guys. You. Thanks for playing. Bravo.